Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining my coffee talk. My name is Madison and I'm the marketing coordinator at the Business Software Center. Each Tuesday at three o'clock London time, we go ahead and do a coffee talk series focusing on different topics. And today's topic is just reviewing the history of software as a service. So just keep in mind our questions and answers section is open for today. Feel free to use that to communicate with me or you can always email me info at businesssoftwarecenter.com or use the hashtag coffee talk TBSC to communicate with me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Let me know how I'm doing. Uh, feel free to engage, ask questions or anything using our social media. So I just want to go ahead and begin by asking you a question. Um, when you think of SAS, what exactly comes to mind? Whenever I ask people this question, usually the first um, response is a company. They'll, they'll think of a company rather than maybe a, a product or you know, the history of SaaS. And one of the most popular um, responses I get to this is Salesforce. But you know, there are so many SaaS companies and software out there that you probably just think of an example of SaaS whenever I ask what comes to mind. So what exactly is software as a service? Well, SaaS is uh, the popular form of cloud computing, and of course it is the easiest form of cloud comp computing currently. Um, there is little to no pressure on managing your own software simply because you can manage it um, directly or indirectly. You can either have your IT department manage it for you, or of course you can um, get a managed service provider or you can use your own management tools to look over your SaaS products. An example of that would be our Smarter SaaS solution that um, tracks and monitors over 40 SaaS applications. Um, of course, SaaS is ready to go. It's right out of the box and um, you don't need to install it at all. So you just simply pay the month to month fee and you're good to go. You don't even have to install it. You can just access everything through web browser or um, yes, access through the cloud. And so other key characteristics of software as a service includes um, it is hosted and delivered online. Um, it is the most commonly used cloud service currently. Um, let's see, it does offer security compliance and maintenance as part of the cost. So I think that's really beneficial. Uh, security is huge and these um, SaaS companies make it their goal to constantly put updates into their products. And so those updates are delivered directly to the cloud. So you're always in compliance and you're always having the best security features through the cloud. Unlike on-premise where you constantly have to install the updates. Anyways, so I'm just gonna go ahead and dive into the history of SaaS. So as far as software goes, um, Grace Hopper is one of the people associated with the development of software. Now, she was a U.S. Navy officer and she was really into mathematics and really into programming language. And so she is considered the um, founder of software. And she uh, was asked why she created the computer and she explained basically that she was lazy and didn't want to keep doing the same things over and over again. And so what she was able to create, IBM um, was able to further develop with software and eventually that just became the norm. So if you missed my talk on who Grace Hopper is, feel free to check us out on YouTube and review. I dive into Grace Hopper in more detail just because she was such a key figure in the history of software. But moving on, um, compatible time sharing systems were developed in the 1960s. And essentially, this is something that helped make computers less bulky and less expensive. So at the, in the 1960s, of course, computers existed, but many um, small businesses never wanted to purchase them just because they were so huge and so expensive. And so MIT was able to come up with the compatible time sharing system. And basically what that was is a, there was a host computer that could hook up to different terminals. And so the terminals would be smaller and they were all connected to this host computer here. It's very, very um, innovative and made it more efficient and quick for 
um, small businesses to get involved with computers. So yeah, I would say in the 1960s, we definitely saw development and that definitely helped with the history of software as a service. So um, in 1976, this is another really key important. Um, I'm sorry, this is another key scenario that happened in history that really helped shape software as we know it today. And it's Bill Gates letter to the hobbyists. And so essentially what happened was Bill Gates noticed that um, companies were just copying and using the software he was creating without his permission. And he was really frustrated with that. And so he wrote a letter to the hobbyists explaining, you know, we're really putting in a lot of this effort to make the software and it's completely unfair that we're not getting um, the recognition, but also the payment that we deserve for this. The stuff isn't free to us. It's eaten up a lot of our time and energy to create and we deserve compensation. And so essentially from this, um, software licenses or the idea of software licenses came to be. And of course, at that time, it was really innovative to do that. But at the same time, these software licenses provided the security so he was able to get compensation for the work that he was doing. And of course, different rules came about due to that, one of them being compliance, another one um, offering um, yearly contracts or five-year contracts, et cetera. And so what was really interesting is Microsoft fo followed this model of selling software uh, that would work on personal computers um, made by other vendors and their licenses would need to be paid for. So if it wasn't for this 1976 letter to the hobbyists, perhaps we would have a different take on um, software licenses in general. And then, of course, software as a service did develop from this to start embodying the month to month to subscription licensing where you can flex your subscribers up or down. You know, back in the early days of software, it, it just was more complex. And now that we have this cloud computing, it just is so much easier to track and monitor software and to really pay for exactly what you're using rather than overpaying or underpaying and getting in the um, red zone and possibly having compliance issues. So then, of course, in 1994, well, I mean, during all the 90s, we definitely saw the dot-com boom, but specifically in 1994, Netscape Navigator shared their secure sockets layer or the SSL protocol. And so basically what this allowed was encrypted transmissions of data over the internet. And what we saw with that is that customers could shop online without the fear of losing their data or their personal information. So essentially we could have customers online shopping and we they wouldn't have to worry about losing their credit card information or um, their contact details. And so, of course, this saw the development of online marketplaces, and this is when Amazon started coming about. And of course, Amazon is the number one uh, marketplace. It's it's dominating at this point in time. And the reason why Amazon is so popular, especially now, is that it's just been keeping up with the change. And it's certainly incorporated software as a service, and it automates a lot of tasks. So it keeps its customers um, informed. It is really quick and efficient and um, yeah, overall just a really good strategy just by keeping up with the change. And so in the 1990s, Larry Ellison, Evan Goldberg and Mark Beinoff were discussing cloud computing. And so basically they were all together and they were really trying to understand the Internet and where it was headed. And so they were all contemplating the impact of the Internet's popularity. And essentially during this discussion, they figured out cloud computing. Then this is where cloud computing was essentially birthed um, and it would change the face of software. So Business Insider magazine pinpoints this discussion as an innovation of cloud computing and um, Evan Goldberg went to find found NetSuite and Mark Beinhoff started Salesforce and the rest is history. So that's why I say, you know, earlier on when I when you think of SaaS, what company do you usually think of? And Salesforce is the first one um, that many people think of just because it is super popular, but at the same time, it's one of the first ones that even came out. Now, on-premise versus cloud computing, I think this is just a really interesting uh, 
example of what the differences are between both and a lot of businesses right now are in a hybrid state. Some use a half and half approach, um, but I predict that cloud computing, of course, will be growing more and more in the future, and we'll go over that soon. But firstly, let's just look at what on-premise is. And so essentially with on-premise, you have to physically manage everything yourself. Everything is down downloaded onto your computers or you have your own um, hardware that it all stays on and it's all um, in your corporation, in your business. And so basically you have to manage your applications, your data, your runtime, your virtualization, your servers, everything like that. Whereas cloud obviously automates a lot of this or just simplifies the process because you can use external servers or cloud servers. So you no longer have to pay for, um, you know, the electricity bill or the upkeep of the hardware and all that other stuff. So the cloud just makes the process a lot easier. And of course, as I mentioned earlier with security, you don't necessarily have to worry about your data um, getting into the wrong ha hands because they do perform a lot of security um, protocols and updates. So that's just a, a really brief example of the differences between on-premise and the cloud. But of of course, cloud computing is the future, and we can see that especially with the growth of remote workers and the pandemic. Fortunately, this pandemic happened over, around over a year ago now, and a lot of us were scrambling and we didn't really know what to do. And so businesses, where they could, switched to remote working. And a lot of businesses floundered those first couple of months during lockdown because some of them were so used to on-premise, they, they haven't switched their... Um, company over to cloud software. And so we here at the Business Software Center want to help. And so if you are still struggling with the um, switch, feel free to get in contact we, with me. We have a cloud migration tool and we can certainly help you get on the cloud today. But yes, what we see is a reduced amount of maintenance on IT with cloud computing, which is really beneficial. This, this enables you to free up your IT department to focus on things that are more, um, I guess, important because essentially what cloud computing does is it just automates processes that are tedious and that um, involve a lot of human error whenever uh, humans try to do things. Um, cloud computing encourages a global workforce, and that's of course because it can be accessed from anywhere, especially through the web URL, through your cell phone, through your laptop. You can be on the go and access meetings, etc. And uh, software as a service developers often focus on being the best of the breed in their core area of focus and function. And because of that, they're constantly trying to improve their product or make new products that just help you in the long run. And this allows businesses to pick and choose which software they need for each function they are looking to improve. So for instance, if you need um, Microsoft 365 just for office tasks, but you also wanna have um, Adobe for your marketing department um, to make brochures, etc. Of course, you can have and pay for both of those um, SaaS products. And then what you can do with smarter SaaS are um, quick, efficient, and cost-effective tool is manage and track your software usage just to ensure you're using everything that you're paying for. So yeah, um, I hope that you were able to get a nice sense of exactly the history of SAS. I know 10 minutes is really hard to um, cram pack everything that we have here. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments area. I'm just gonna check and see if we have any questions coming in. And I can try to answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, I don't see any questions coming in. Of course, if you're a little shy, that's fine. Feel free to email me at info at Um, Yeah, so that was the history of SAS. And as you can see on my screen here, our next coffee talks are um, benchmarking Microsoft 365 usage and implementation. So that's just gonna take a, a closer look specifically at Microsoft 365. Then we have audio and visual with Microsoft Teams. Um, I would say if you have a remote working staff, it might be best if you join in on this, especially if you use Teams because you can get tools to certainly improve your communication. And then um, we do have a partner talk 
on April 6th with our partner Ring Central, and we are going to discuss how you can improve your resources and manage your remote staff. So yeah, three really good um, talks coming up. Of course, these are all free to join into, so you're welcome to join them. Just checking to see if we have any questions coming in yet. I don't see any, that's okay. Um, and I will post this video on YouTube later on today, so if you ever need to rewatch it, it will be available for you. Thank you so much for joining me, and as always, I hope you have a great day. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.